Welcome to 2024. I hope everyone's had a splendid Christmas and uh, or holiday period or whatever it is you might celebrate at this time of year and are looking forward and raring to go for 2024. I'm sort of cranking up to it. I've had several colds and it's slowed me up. Um, that's a, another common feature at this time of year, I'm afraid. Um, but here we are. I've produced this ninth story in my series. It's called Vacancy Filled. And it's about a young man uh, who's rather dissipated and uh, goes in search of a flat one rainy lunchtime in South London and meets his match. A light drizzle had settled in over the city south of the river during the morning, and at lunchtime it started in earnest. It was raining hard in London now. There was no wind, just the sound of cascading water from rain-black gutters and the ambient hiss of traffic from the glistening roads. It was July, but you would only know this from the dripping broad leaves of the bright green sycamores and maple trees, and the grass vivid amongst the muted greys and soft red bricks of the houses lining the streets. Johnny wished he'd bought that umbrella he'd been thinking about when the weather first broke at Wimbledon last week, but he'd bought three of them earlier in the year and lost them all, and had resolved to hold out until the autumn at least. He resented shelling out constantly in support of the capricious English weather. It felt like he was supporting a pointless charity. He'd been lucky so far. The weather had been benign all spring, and splendid for most of June. Its being Wimbledon week should have told him something. A cricket test match would probably have been as fatal to the weather prospects too. But now the weather had truly turned, and what a day for it. It was lunchtime in Clapham High Street, and Johnny was on a tight schedule to make it down from Victoria to look at a vacant flat in his sixty-minute lunch break. It was an optimistic call. Too many lunchtimes with Bev, Henry's secretary, had sensitized them to his, well, flexible timekeeping. But that whole business with Bev was all in the past now. It had been crazy from the start, and Tina, well, thankfully she was none the wiser about any of it. Unlike Bev's husband, unfortunately, who had filed for divorce. What a mess! Johnny emerged from the refuge of the train station and noted that the rain was still falling unabated. He'd have to chance it. He hadn't the luxury of time to try to sit out such uncertainty. You wouldn't think there was that much rain in the sky, he heard someone say, passing a wet newspaper stand where a boy stood grinning, spiting the weather from beneath the hood of his yellow anorak. Johnny turned up his collar and stepped out quickly into the street and crossed the road, making his way into the high street. For weeks it had been dusty and lazy with flies, now halfway down the high street and his suit was wet. Soon it would be saturated, probably ruined. His old overcoat would have been helpful today, except it would smell like a wet dog in this. He'd have to shake himself out when he got there to number 76 Amberley Road. What a state he'd look. Johnny could scent the rain against the blackened chimney walls of the street as the figures went by, hurrying in the deluge. He ignored the shops, their dripping canopies unfurled, the temptations of refuge from the rain, because he was pressed for time, and it was not his friend today. He went past a man staring forlornly at a sign which advised, Wet paint. It was wet, wet paint, wet in the rain. He couldn't fault this. People were hurrying in the street, caped, capped, secure in their hats and coats, umbrellaed against the downpour. Sensible people, dangerous as stags, antlers clashing angrily as they passed in peril. All except him. 
he broke briefly into a half-hearted jog and tried to keep into the shadows of the buildings walling the street in the hope they would afford some scant protection against the rain. But it seemed to be coming straight down, and he was picking up the long, heavy drips from blind extrusions, signs, jutting barbershop poles, and all kinds of other hazards of the street. His phone was clutched in his hand, deep inside his jacket pocket, with Clapham High Street opened in Google Maps. This was a new phone. He'd left his last one on a number 38 bus from Piccadilly one evening. Perhaps it was sitting in a lost property office somewhere, in company with his overcoat and three umbrellas, and all the other lost, unloved, and mislaid items congregating there from across the city, mourning their owners. Of course, he might not even like the flat, but he and Tina needed somewhere. It sounded good in the advert, and it would be the fresh start they needed. The split up after Christmas was silly. Her removal to her parents' house in Gillingham was just a temporary thing. It had let him off the leash a little. He'd strayed, inevitably. And then Bev. God, the embarrassment of seeing her each day was his penance for this transgression. It would pass, he reasoned. He knew that from experience. Her dark-shadowed, sorrowful eyes were gradually becoming a malevolent violet, withering in their contempt as he encountered her on the stairs or in the lift. He sighed. Far too many people knew about that foolishness. They had been too incautious in seizing their opportunities for a few fumbled, lustful moments. It had been dangerous to begin with, dangerous fun, then less fun, just dangerous. He began to see the suspicions in others' eyes, probably even where there were no suspicions. He caught whispers and fake smiles, and abrupt silences punctuating the end of conversations when he appeared at the tea point. And then the lust had gone. It was extinguished. He had become bored, or just come to his senses. He wasn't sure which, but Bev had begun to seem silly to him, not too bright. Anyway, the excitement was spent. Now there was just this disapprobation hanging about him like a filthy day. It was a life lesson, perhaps. The flat felt like a kind of atonement to him, making amends to Tina. He couldn't waste time over it because it was newly advertised in loot. The market was good for renters this time of year, and if it was halfway decent, or even if it wasn't, it had begun by tea time. There was a blue-striped canopy above the butchers in the high street, and he braved the smell of dead animals, a feast for Sundays, listing in the future of many tables, and took respite there to consult the Google street map on his phone. He was about halfway there by his reckoning. In another minute he turned down Amberley Road, and the map told him it was the other end of the road he wants. It would be. He set up a good pace for the last leg of his journey and swung along the drab road, glistening wet, venting his fury into the wet pavements with the hardness of his heels. He was the only person without an umbrella and without a coat. If only he'd bought that umbrella. He was counting the even numbers off the houses as he made a brisk pace down the road and tried to estimate how many doors ahead number 76 might be. He was at number 54. Then this gave way to a guessing game of what colour door it would be. It will be a maroon door, he thought, purposely pessimistic, because he knew if it turned out to be the green one up ahead, which was nearer, it'd be a bonus, and his ordeal would be at an end. In fact, a new life might be just beginning. Well, perhaps, if the landlady liked him. He'd have to charm her. Perhaps she'd pity him for his saturated condition. Tina wanted a place of their own, and he wasn't unwilling. It was a reaction to the Bev business, of course. He and Tina had been together since college. But since their split-up last Christmas, he's been messing around too much, even for him, and all the while trying to get back with Tina. But after the uncomfortable business with Bev, it might be a good thing to sort himself out. Tina had found out about the one at Christmas, the one before Bev, that is. 
and it would be the end if she found out about Bev too. She's tense, watchful at the moment. Her parents and friends are briefing against him furiously. That's the reason for it. They have nothing good to say about him. Ever since that time he tried to kiss Tina's sister at her twenty-first. She'd forgiven him for that, but they hadn't. And the sister, Tess, regarded him with a disdain bordering on utter contempt. The girl at Christmas had been the last straw for Tina. She moved back home. It was just a Christmas party thing, he had, foolishly, told her. How he had smiled wryly at the remembrance of that folly. And then he had taken up with Bev around Easter in a loose moment. Bev wasn't happy. She's getting divorced now and told him the news of this as if she expected him to fall on one knee. He was, of course, quite aghast at this prospect. It had been a somewhat unpleasant scene between them. It was just fun, he told her amiably, a queasy smile on his face. Disarmingly, he hoped. She wasn't disarmed, and his hope in it was misplaced. She was angry. They hadn't spoken since, and she passed him in the corridor in work with a wounded look, which was well on its way to becoming a fixed scowl, radiating ill-will towards him. Women! Her friends regarded him with candid loathing, too, occasionally masked as indifference when circumstances required. He was sure one of them, at least, fancied him, but it would take a few drinks to test that theory out now. He wondered if his boss, Henry, knew. He probably did, even if Bev hadn't told him tearfully one sniffling lunchtime. Nothing was said, of course, but it can hardly have improved his career prospects. It's the green door. He's worked it out now, with only four doors remaining. He opens the green wooden picket gate and strides up to the door, lifts the knocker and shakes himself mopping his face with a damp handkerchief and wiping his hair with it. He's just smeared it round his wet collar too when the door opens. Hello, is it Victoria? He says brightly to the woman who opens it, as if he's not been rolling around in the street like a long-haired mongrel. I rang earlier about the flat. Oh yes, she says, but sees at once the brightness of his attitude is a deceit. My goodness, you're soaking wet, she says. Do come in. It's a terrible day. Don't you have an umbrella? I lost my umbrella. It's not so bad, he lies pleasantly, jaunty with customary ease. It's John, isn't it? Johnny, he says gently, not wanting to correct her, but inviting a nice informality. He wishes momentarily his name was Bob. Now there's informal for you. He offers her his wet hand, which she takes with her warm, dry one. It is an intimate gesture in some small way, which passes between them like a secret vibration. You're freezing, she says. She's warm, thinks Johnny. She gazes at him. Perhaps she senses his thought, but turns and allows him through into the hallway beyond, and then closes the door. Too bad you had to come out in this dreadful weather, she says sympathetically. Oh, well, Wimbledon, what should we expect? He laughs. Oh, yes, she concurs. There is a happy accord in the matter of the inclement weather. It's a good start. She's about forty-five, he thinks. Black hair, a nice skirt, and white blouse. He sees her bra straps visible beneath the blouse. If only it was wet, he thinks. Good God, so soon? Johnny is surprised for a moment at the incontinence of his thoughts. They're always sneaking up on him. He checks himself. This is a disease, he decides. He is looking for a home for Tina and himself. He's twenty-five now. It's time. Is he incapable of learning any lesson at all? This is a fresh start. Would you like a cup of tea to warm you up a bit? asks Victoria. Then I'll show you the flat. If it's not too much trouble, he says. What a nice young man, 
That is what she is thinking, Johnny thinks to himself. He follows her down left of the staircase, past the telephone, and into a long kitchen where an aromatic smell of herbs pervades, and no hint of fast foods or last night's curry houses or Chinese takeaways can be discerned. Tina will like this. As you see, this is the kitchen, she says unnecessarily. Very nice, he says. It's big. Damn! She caught him looking at her rear, just as he said that. She laughs lightly. Yes, it is, she says. He feels momentarily foolish, devoid of inspiration. Sit down, she says, motioning vaguely at the kitchen table. He takes one of the wooden chairs placed around the table, selecting one carefully, open to the room, not exclusive. He nods, satisfied, his confidence returning. She's standing at the kitchen surface a little way away, side on to him, hanging salon tea bags over the side of two fastidious china teacups. So what do you do? she inquires. She's got her back to him now as she attends to the tea. High heels, she's come from work. Handsome, not beautiful. Black hair. But what is it about women in high heels? And when she turns to face him, there is something of late summer in her grey eyes. He smiles. I'm an accounts manager for a telecoms firm, he says brightly. First com. Do you know them? The big new building behind Victoria Street. What about you? I'm a solicitor in Paddington, she says. It's a bit of a pain these days because I have to catch the overhead train and then the circle line round to Paddington to get to work. We used to have an office in Victoria at the time I bought this house twenty years ago. It was convenient then, but we moved out. Oh, that's interesting, he says, feigning interest pleasantly. What a wonderful body she has he thinks, studiously, conspicuously avoiding being caught in his appraisal of it, which is candid. Sugar and milk? she asks. Two, please. No milk. Where are you living, at the moment? she inquires. I'm in a room in a shared house, but it's quite small, and my girlfriend lives in Kent with her parents. We've been looking for somewhere for a while now. There's the slightest hesitation over his use of the word girlfriend, as if he's inadvertently used a vulgarism. He wonders if she's noticed. Victoria doesn't blink, but he reddens at the falseness of pretense, his duplicity. He wonders if it shows the guilt, the deception, a history of it. She brings the cups and their saucers over to the table and takes a seat at right angles to him. What's your girlfriend's name? inquires Victoria, sipping her tea. Tina, he says. She's a secretary. Oh, she says, and nothing further. He feels somewhere deep inside he's cheating on Tina already. Do you want me to hang your things on the radiator? asks Victoria. Their eyes meet, and his weaken further in resolve. I mean the jacket he says, unblinking. Of course, he says. You're very kind, thank you. They're momentarily close as she takes his jacket and he's shrouded again in her perfume and warmth. He rubs his chin and places his hands together, interleaves his fingers in a prayer. It's an attempt at self-control. She walks with his jacket to a radiator and hangs it meticulously over the back of a chair there smooths the shoulders with her hands. He watches her, his clasped hands tingling with the imagination of her smooth body all the way across the room. "'You've lived here a long time, then?' he asks suddenly, feeling the want of conversation, the need to break the mould. "'I hope she doesn't think I mean she's old. What a cheeky bugger!' she'll think. "'Yes, I've been here a long time.' It's too much space for me, and I decided to divide it off a few years ago and started letting out the flat, thinking ahead for retirement. She laughs vaguely. He feels it incumbent upon him to dispute this, but senses it would be crass, even for him, especially with her. 
Her laughter condenses into a watchful smile, leaves a space. It's expectant, almost a challenge. He must respond. He's inept and shameless, as he says. I'm sure you don't have to think about that for a long time. It is crass, but it's the correct response. She smiles at him knowingly. He is still in the shroud of her perfume. It's nice to have the company. Someone in the flat, she says. The young men who have taken the place previously only stay a short time. I expect they have their own lives to lead. Young people starting out tend to move on. Anyway, shall we have a look at the flat? She leads the way out into the hall, and he follows her up the narrow stairs. He slips dreaming in the intimacy of her, the imagination of her naked body wending its way up the stairs before him. She reaches the top of the stairs and turns to him. There is a hint of breathlessness between them. It's the exertion, but in the gloom of the landing, on such an overcast day, it feels like they're too close, a moment from an embrace. Here's the bathroom, she says. There's only a shower in the flat, but you're welcome to use this whenever you like, if you fancy a bath. There's no lock on the door, so shout out before entering. Oh, right, yes, he says. She pushes the door of the bathroom open by leaning into it deftly with her hip, exquisitely, and they walk in. These are her things, the intimacy she unwittingly shares with him now. He sees her in his mind's eye, stepping from the bath, a look of surprise on her face. Their eyes meet. Good God, it's fortunate she can't know my thoughts, he thinks. He has to keep himself in check. He looks again at her towel. There is a silence. She watches him closely and then turns to the bath disparagingly. I need to get the bath sealed in, she says. You can't use the shower attachment just yet, because the water comes through the ceiling. Do you use the shower in the flat at the moment? Oh, occasionally, but I normally take a bath, she says. I'll show you the shower come bathroom in the flat. She leads from the bathroom along the landing and via a two-step carpeted drop left into the shower room. Here it is, she says. I'll miss the shower, though. I like to take a shower before work. Johnny says nothing. He sees her vivid through the frosted glass panel, the room filled with hot steam. Such thoughts ache silently in his imagination. They move away, but in his mind he's still outside the door of the shower, loitering with intent there. As you see, this is the flat. The alterations were done a couple of years ago, a friend was going to come here to live, but he went to New York to work at the United Nations for a couple of years instead. So, she shrugged away New York, the United Nations, and the unknown specter of a friend. This looks perfect, he says. Do you think so? she asks innocently. Yes, Victoria. Vicky, she says. Again, the intimacy between them flares up, is hardly suppressed, and as she darts over to a window and attends to a curtain which doesn't fall correctly, but has rested upon the sill, he weighs her up again, the fragrant curve of her. Her back is turned to him, but she must surely know. No, of course not. What is the matter with me? I have to stop this, he thinks. She turns to him, smiles quietly from the window. Take a look at the garden, she says. He joins her. The garden's fantastic, he says. Ah, rather wet at the moment. I won't need to water it today, she laughs, a light, subtle trill at her unguarded levity, which he joins in easy accord, and then she says soberly, I like gardening. I put a new patio in a couple of years ago and a water feature. You can just see it from here. It's all a water feature today, he laughs. Yes. They move close near to the window pane and to each other to take in the water feature and linger in its contemplation. It looks amazing, Johnny murmurs. 
there are four rather grotesque stone gnomes standing ostentatious in the garden. I like your gnomes, he says, and immediately regrets it. Oh, thank you, she says, gracious and seemingly oblivious to anything else in her acknowledgement, her voice vibrating close to his ear. He can hear the movement of her clothes, too, and the distant sound of traffic on wet roads. He feels the warmth emanating from her. I think of them as my boys, she laughs quietly. Then disengaging, she leads him to the empty bedroom. It's a good size, the bedroom, she says. I used to sleep here when I first moved into the house, until I had the front bedroom remodeled. I had a double bed against the chimney breast, and a wardrobe over here, and a dressing table in front of the window. She walks to the window, her hands outstretched before her, defining the position of the dressing table. He can see her in the morning, moving lazy from her bed, and languid before the sash windows, stretching her arms wide, and her long throat in the sunlight streaming through the open curtains. It's a great room, he says. I like it, she says. She doesn't mind his fawning over the general accommodation, and the tour is finally done. It is a success. Johnny is satisfied. I've made a good impression, he thinks. She likes me. She's probably attracted to me, too. Downstairs, she asks him what he thinks of the place, and obligingly he eulogizes, of course. It's settled, then. He can move in. Johnny is delighted. All is amicable between them. He has worked his charm. He smiles broadly at her, and she smiles at him in pleasant intercourse. Thirty minutes later, the rain seems to be clearing a little as Johnny stands beneath the butcher's canopy again, and this time thumbs his mobile phone urgently. He'll be late back to work, unfortunately. They'll think the worst, of course. Hi, Tina, it's me, he says as the phone is answered somewhere across the city. Hello, me, says Tina, excited. Did you see it? Yes, it's perfect. You'll love it, he tells her. Oh, I wish I could have seen it, says Tina. He's been waiting for his call. A packet of crisps is open on her desk. Her sandwiches have gone. Tell me all about it, she says excitedly, closing an open magazine and examining her nails. Together at last, she thinks, quelling her remaining doubts and hugging herself in delight. It's at the end of a long Victorian road of those sort of villas. You know the kind of thing, with a picket-style wooden gate and a tiled porch, he tells her. I love those, she says. The living room is newly decorated, and the bathroom is recently done. It's a shower room, actually. Tina's trying to picture it all in her mind as he describes it to her as best he can. She's moving her things in already as he goes through each room with her. Did you take it? Tell me you did, Johnny. Well, he begins heavily. He's teasing her with his delay, but he can't hold it for long. Yes. The landlady lives in the other part of the house. The landlady lives there. Is that a good idea? Tina queries. Yes, it's a big house. The landlady's nice, a really nice woman. Victoria, you'll like her. Oh, okay. I suppose if it's that good, and we do need somewhere, she says, recalibrating her impressions of their new life to accommodate what she supposes to be an elderly landlady, possibly with a cat. Yes, trust me, you'll love it, Johnny says. The afternoon is brightening in Clapham. At number 76 Amberley Road, Victoria washes up the teacups at the kitchen sink and places them on the draining board. She starts to roll down her sleeves and then stops, is thoughtful for a moment, before continuing and doing up the buttons on the cuffs. She takes up the tea towel and dries the cups and the saucers thoroughly, polishing them to a fine gleam which catches the sudden light now penetrating the clouds. The rain seems to have stopped, 
a white pigeon is sitting on a low roof to the right side of the house. In the new brightness it looks like a dove. Perhaps it will have an olive branch in its beak. She smiles as she hangs the towel neatly over the edge of the sink and smooths it with her hands like a man's jacket. Of course, she knows. She knew it as soon as she opened the door to him, knew from his eyes, from the slight alteration in his breathing. She saw it in his awkward hands, uncertain in their gestures because they longed to fumble with her blouse from his closeness and his parted lips, from the tone of his voice, its slightly stilted murmuring, his lingering at the sash window overlooking the garden. And he likes fine homes. She laughs suddenly at the recollection of this. I should have slapped his face. He thought I didn't notice how his eyes stared unblinking at mine as he struggled to resist their straying downwards across my blouse front, though it was obvious where his thoughts were all the time. And as I turned away, how quickly they betrayed him. He'll notice when I wear my see-through nighty and he's in the kitchen. He'll notice when he finds me borrowing his shower when I'm supposed to think he's at work. What a fool to such contrivances. And Tina? The hesitation over the word girlfriend. He wondered if I noticed. Of course I noticed it. The fragility of their relationship was plain to see. She'll catch the two of us together and leave. I'll see to that in the second week. And when I tire of Johnny, well, we'll see. From the window above the kitchen sink, she can see the garden now vivid in the sunlight. The four gnomes stand with ruddy faces, smiling with recent mirth. I think it's time for a fifth gnome in the garden, she says. The sun is streaming through the window. There'll be more sun, though it isn't forecast. Victoria reaches up to a cupboard and places the teacups there. The phone in the hall is ringing. It'll be the agency she thinks. Hello? Yes, yes, it's taken. Thank you. Goodbye. Victoria walks to the kitchen sink serenely and turns, leans with her back against it, facing out to the long kitchen. She tosses her head in rehearsal of a moment foreseen, smooths with her long hands the black skirt along her thighs, and smiles. Vacancy filled, she says softly.